Welcome, everyone. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the Groundswell team, um, Alex Cherry and the family, for inviting us down um, and agreeing to host a hemp panel. Um, I think everyone would agree it's been a, a really eye-opening uh, couple of days with really good discussions, a lot of mixtures of opinions, which is great, some really lively debates, um, and hopefully, uh, yeah, some inspiration for, for everyone to take away. Um, so my name is Nathaniel Loxley. I'm uh, research director at the British Hemp Alliance. Um, BHA is a multi-stakeholder group um, involved in uh, environmental change uh, and advocacy for hemp. Uh, we're a not-for-profit membership organization, um, and we have a range of different farmers, organizations, individuals, uh, research organizations as well, um, as, as members as well. So it's a growing mo movement, um, and we're, we're happy to get um, yeah, the opportunity to exhibit and uh, yeah, invite more members to join. So thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the Innovative Farmers um, for uh, their kind uh, support. Um, they've actually enabled us to bring a group of farmers together um, to start doing some practical uh, testing um, and, and looking at some of the impacts that hemp has on the, the carbon, the carbon sequestration, soil health, uh, and biodiversity, so below ground and above ground. So. We started that project last year, kind of halfway through the summer, and we're very lucky to, to see that through until the end of next year. So um, there will be findings from that, hopefully, and the, the plan will be to roll that out to more farmers, more participants, and it's really an ac accessible way for farmers to, to try and start measuring um, what's going on uh, in the environmental impact. So yeah, as, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's plenty of challenges um, with hemp farming, and licensing and all those issues, but uh, without further ado, I think I'll pass it over to our panelists. So I'll let everyone introduce themselves and their background and, and what they kind of, what brings them here today, uh, their experience with hemp. So I'll start with Dr. Lydia Smith from NIAB. So hello, thank you so much for, oh, so, something, so much for inviting me, Nathaniel, uh, to this uh, last session of the day. Um, I've had a fantastic uh, groundswell, so it's been great to, to be part of your panel as well as part of the event. I am uh, Lydia Smith. I've been at NIAB for a scary 23 years, um, and I've been working on and off with hemp for, um, for a good number of those, looking at the potential. After I started at NIAB, uh, one of the things that I set about doing was looking at what new crops are out there if they're out there, what might we do with them? And if there's a problem with them, how might we address that? And uh, somewhere along the line, I set up uh, Niab Innovation Farm, where we demonstrated crops. We've actually had a, um, a break from that because nobody was allowed to come visit us over the last couple of years, but uh, we'll go back to that at some point. So uh, I don't know whether you want everyone to invite themselves in turn, or I'll carry on and talk about um, what I wanted uh, to sure, do. Sure, yeah, a quick, brief introduction. If you'd like to pass it over to, to Glyn. Uh, Hello, um, my name's Glyn. I'm from Jersey, the Channel Islands, um, where hemp is grown free, um, not restrained at all. So we can grow flour in the fields without any protection at all, um, which is quite interesting because Jersey is an English protectorate. So it'll be quite interesting to see how that, and we've been doing that for three, four years now. Um, and strangely enough, people aren't getting high, um, which is amazing. Um, anyway, my, my trip into this is very much along the lines of um, Jersey Hemp called me up uh, because they were unable to grow the hemp to a significant size. I'm a soil engineer, for want of better words, and my job is to make the soil really healthy so we can get 16-foot plants, and that's what I do for a living. I farm carbon. So I'll come back to that at a later stage, but should we pass over? Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Mick Vose from East Yorkshire Hemp, and uh, I'm here as a, a hemp grower. We've been growing since... 2002 so we've already done 20 years it's <laughs> and but we also have uh, on-site processing so we're decorticating and selling clean hemp clean, clean hemp fiber clean hemp shiv and uh, briquettes for log bearing stoves that we make from any of the waste products and yeah that's that's me in a nutshell really. 
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Dr Linda Deeks. I work at Cranfield University as a soil scientist there. Uh, my other hat is I'm the Southwest Soils Discussion Group Chair for the British Society of Soil Science. Uh, my passion, as you might uh, gather from that, is soils. So I have to admit, not knowing that much about hemp, but it's been great working with Nathaniel and the others on the in Innovative Farming Group uh, to learn about hemp. But my interest is, is soil health. So any plant-plant interaction with the soil, how that can build in resilience um, for the future of farming, basically. How can we continue? Uh, I'm Camilla uh, from Ashby Farms, which is a uh, family's mixed farm down in Kent, sheep and arable. And we're in our second year of growing hemp now, so relatively new to the game, uh, still learning a lot. Um, and I'm also doing a Nuffield scholarship at the moment, researching hemp and how uh, we can kickstart the UK hemp industry as a result of the challenges and the gaps in knowledge that um, I saw through starting growing crop on the farm. So uh, just uh, went to the States a couple of months ago. That was the first bit of Nuffield travel that I've been able to do. Um, and hopefully lots more ahead. Excellent. Well, thank you. Um, I think you'd agree everyone's uh, got their different kind of perspectives and coming at hemp from a different um, angle. Um, I think that's the kind of beauty of it. I think there's a really great um, feeling of collaboration. Everyone's kind of battling uh, a lot of uh, the challenges um, or trying to solve some of the problems. Um, and there is, there is a, a great kind of ethos of collaboration. I think that kind of fits in very nicely with the, the, the groundswell um, feeling and, and I think yeah, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I'd like to kind of pick up, obviously, uh, from some of the experience um, that Lydia's had. Um, I think you said you've been working with hemp for nearly 20 years yeah, at NIAB. I mean, that's, that's quite impressive. I think we've, we've seen a lot of farmers come through the, the pitch um, over the couple of days um, who have grown hemp previously. Uh, we'll get over to some of those uh, experiences and challenges in a bit more detail, but I mean, what's your experience about the kind of innovation or the alternative crop side of things? Have you got? Yeah, thanks, Nathaniel. I, I think what I wanted to say about hemp is, and, and what's come at me in terms of what people think about it over the years, is a crop of extremes. And that is to say that um, when talking about hemp, people are coming up with these. Um, you know, the most type uh, comments about it. And I, I just listed them, actually, before I was uh, going to come and join you. So the first one, the most carbon sequestration, and I'm not, not going to steal your fire, uh, then we'll get into a bit more soil detail, but I suppose there's two components to that. Carbon sequestration, there's already an argument now. Are we talking about something that lasts for 100 years or more, or are we talking about something that is... That is um, gathered and is retained in the soil to a greater or lesser extent, and if so, how much. So I, th I think that, um, yes, it, it is uh, fabulous at capturing carbon. There's no doubt about that. There's lots of other crops. I think probably uh, it would be good not to get too overexcited about whether it's the most or the best, but actually it's just brilliant, and let's find out more about that. I'll return to that in a second. The next swing the highest number of potential products, and uh, I've heard thousands quoted, and there's no doubt that there are a lot of products that can come from hemp, um, probably a lot more than many of the crop species. So literally, you can just tick off oil and the shiv, which goes into building, and the fiber that goes into any number of things. And then, you know, as you sort of dive down in those categories, you've got the bioplastics, You've got uh, the high end of fibres into clothing going right down to sort of um, very uh, tough material that might go into insulation or something. So there's no doubt about it. It has a lot of products. And I think as a farmer, that, that gives you a feeling of potential resilience because if you lose one uh, outcome, then there's potential for others. And I'm not going to, sorry, not hog the stage now, so I'll try and whiz through the rest of them. The lowest inputs for pest diseases and uh, nutrients. Again, probably quite a lot of truth in that. Um, and I think it's always the way, isn't it? I remember when I first started working in, in agriculture 
a lot longer ago than 20 years. Um, and oilseed rape was the big new crop and it didn't get any pests or diseases and it was just wonderful. Well, hey, here we are now. So yeah, let's hold that feeling that, that hemp is a low input crop but um, yeah, let's be realistic about what would happen if we started growing it in very large quantities. Most difficult paperwork. I'm not even going to get bogged down in this, but yes, you know, we all know there are issues with, with getting a license for hemp. Um, it is a necessary evil. Um, one thing I heard when I was talking to uh, a home office person a little while ago was that uh, the UK had the doubtful privilege of being the... Um, the place in the whole of Europe, and I'm not talking just the EU, but Europe as a source of high THC products. And that's something that government needs to deal with, but obviously to deal with in a way that, that works for, for, for all of the potential stakeholders. Um, greatest potential in terms of new crops in rotation to do things like control agronom agronomic difficulties, so controlling weeds, difficulties with black grass. We've got uh, difficulties with... Um, with lolium coming forward with, with, with ryegrass. So I think all of these things really are, they're up there and why people get excited about hemp and why it's, it's a fabulous, exciting new crop. How to deal with them, how to seize that opportunity. And again, I've written down uh, a little list here, varieties. So I would, I would say varieties, wouldn't I? I am, after all, from Nyab. And, you know, varieties will make your crop successful or not. We only have just restarted the national listing system. So NIAB does it for hemp. We do it for various other species, of course. Um, there's only a handful of varieties that have been tested. And so, you know, the market should drive this, but let's not lose sight of the fact you need the right variety for the right job. So if you're going to be growing uh, a high-quality shiv that's going into uh, building materials, that's not going to be the same as a, as a very high, fine long fibre quality that's going into clothing. So let's push those varieties through the system. We at NIAB do the, the VCU, the value for cultivation and use, sorry, let's get not bogged down in these silly terms. Uh, the DUS is done elsewhere. So it should be quite quick and easy to push them through the system. You know, we've only got a handful. So the 80 odd varieties that our friends in the, the other side of the sea in, in the EU can use, we can't use all those at the moment. So we must push them through the system. Um, we need to capture lots of data, and again, I'm not going to steal uh, Lynn's um, thunder here. Uh, we need infrastructure. Okay, I'm going to just shout. We need infrastructure. Uh, I'm looking at Jamie in the audience there, who's dealing with the many issues with a lack of infrastructure in, in dealing with processing hemp, um, and maybe others on the board are going to talk about that, maybe not. Um, government support. So government support is there. Let's, you know, let's be upbeat about the way that DEFRA is dealing with um, bringing hemp back into uh, the farmed environment. They have their things that they have to deal with, but they're putting a lot of time and effort into trying to help us to, to overcome some of the difficulties. And um, networking bringing the farmers together to deal with all these things, and that seamlessly allows me to hand over to my colleague on my left here, who's going to talk about some of those issues. Uh, well, yeah, the one thing that comes to me straight away is quality. Um, that's something that hemp can hand out in bucket loads, whether that's quality of produce, quality of fabric, quality of fibre. All of these are really big in the industry, and I think this is probably one of the the reasons that um, you know hemp has been a bit of a challenge because it's uh, it's got a, a lot of competition out there. You know the hemp is you've heard the expression the hemp can be stronger than steel. It can replace the battery. It can fuel and everything else. But the one thing that I'm really passionate about is the quality of the carbon that the the hemp can actually sequester. Um, and uh, this is why I was brought into the game by Jersey Hemp. Jersey Hemp learned very, very quickly that the quality of the carbon in their soil was not sufficient following the Jersey Royal Potatoes, um, which had stripped the carbon from the soils predominantly, um, to actually grow a decent crop. So hemp does need carbon. It needs that carbon source, the quality of carbon, in order to, to, to bolt like a, a rabbit or whatever. Um, so 
but it's a different type of carbon. It's, um, it's carbon, as I call it, a living carbon. And this is not what you'll hear much of, but because the way a plant photosynthesizes, um, it sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere, we all know that. It retains about 40% in the above the growth bit, but it also sweats out a lot of carbon from the roots. Um, and that, the reason for that is to actually attract the microbes, which bring in all the nutrients, the minerals and the nutrients to feed the plant. Now, because hemp grows so fast, it's pulling out a lot of nutrients from those, those, those soils. In other words, it needs a lot of microbes around the roots to actually you know, trade the, the carbon sugars for these minerals for, with. So the, the plant, because it's such a tall plant, has a very deep taproot. Um, and it can access minerals a lot deeper than the normal crops, which then it brings up to the surface, but it will retain that in a certain part. And as long as the farming actions, i.e. are regenerative and aren't taking more than nature, you know, nature needs in order to keep herself going, I leave 40% of the crop alone um, for nature to regenerate, which hemp can do, because you can leave a root, a deep root in it if you don't till you can leave quite a lot of the stem in it if you combine it hard. And you can t just take the, you know, the flat, the, the, the fiber bit, and if you're in Jersey, you're allowed to take the flower. Um, so it's quite profitable from that sense. But you're also building your soil health for the next crop that goes through. So what we're doing, how we're doing this, um, is we've formed what we call hubs. And a hub is literally um, like a soil engineer. What we do is work with um, the soils to try and get them so that they're able to, they're really well prepared for the, the plant, for the hemp, so that when the farmer plants the, the hemp, they can be the racing driver. The hemp can grow 16 foot and it can yield, absolute max out on its yields because all those microbes and things are working. The switches are turned on in the root systems. And that's what we're hoping to bring over to the UK very soon um, to start to help farmers coming into the industry who are, might be um, growing on you know, carbon depleted soils, they might be carbon loaded soils, but if you're missing the microbes, then you're missing the switches being turned on and we just turn the switches on or help turn the switches on. And then again, it comes back to quality. It's the quality of that carbon. What type of carbon is it that you're actually doing? Is it going to increase your productivity, your profitability? Um, through the quality of the product, i.e., um, you know, the nutrient cycling. I know farmers who are getting 300 times more than the price of carbon because the nutrient density of their produce, the following crop from hemp, is that much more and it's going into the top restaurants in London. And this is where it starts to come really interesting and how to get the hemp into the rotation. Remember, it's only a three month crop, it's out within three, three months, so your next crop can go in. And if you're clever and work with your cover crops and your cash crops, and again, all of them can become cash crops over time as long as you're building soil health. I think I've gone on for too long already, and I can carry <laughs> on forever. But, um, no, that's great. I think, yeah, yeah, summarizing the kind of uh, the, the soil health elements, I think biochar, we were talking about biochar earlier, and maybe that's a fantastic added, added value to the, to the farmer. Um, but I think obviously Nick's got more the kind of market insight over the last 20 years what do you think over the last 20 years a boom and bust of hemp and yeah it must be a roller coaster for you <laughs> yeah well um 20 years ago when we first grew our when we grew our first crop of hemp we grew it for hemcor in essex um that went well until hemcor in essex ceased to be and then we had a big pile of hemp straw that we needed to do something with so we started processing with bits of machine we had on the farm and up until 2012 that's what we were doing um no up until 20, 2009 when we had our fire that's what we were doing 2012 we put all our new equipment in and now we're producing clean decorticated fiber supplying um varied industries um from high-end cottonized but hemp to go into cottonizing to be mixed into with mixed with cotton to make very high quality jeans wear. I can't say who it's for, but very high quality jeans wear. Um, all the way down through biocomposites and um, hoping to get mats for growing microgreens on as a soil replacement. Um, struggling a bit with the manufacture of that at the moment, but it's it's coming. Um, similar sort of non-woven mats going into. Um, Bio, hemp, hemp biocomposites, 
and then a lot of hemp fibre will is will go into loft insulation when the factory is up and running in Scotland. Um, a, a, a company called Indian H is putting a factory in Scotland to use use our hemp to start with. Then the then they're planning on a cooperative in Scotland to feed that factory, and then I can concentrate on the other smaller markets again until their next factory goes up or Jamie's factory goes up or however it's going to work. But the, the, the amount of um, interest in hemp fibre products or hemp shiv for hemp building products is it's just it's taking off. It's, it's daily. There is new people have, with new ideas. So it's, the potential is fantastic. Um, but we need the expertise of people like Glenn um, to help us maintain yields. Mm. I think our yields have gone down because we're not looking after our soil as well as we need to. But one of the main things is it's, it's left without a crop on for too long, which after coming here, I'm going to remedy some of, the, some, some of these problems. Um, and then, yeah, everybody else here, I mean, Lydia with, uh, not Lydia, uh, yeah, Lydia um, from NIAB, hopefully we can have some valuable, valuable information come from, come from NIAB and uh, the innovative farmers thing is uh, hopefully going to produce some real good results. So, Absolutely. I, th I think, yeah, you hit the nail on the head in terms of the exciting opportunities that are out there. I think we all agree um, processing is... Um, yeah, a big factor, a big uh, kind of gap in, in, in some regards um, in terms of different regions. I think growing um, in smaller areas, um, a cooperative model like they do in France or anywhere else other than the UK at the moment, um, is, is a collaborative way of, of going about. Um, Linda, have you had any, in your Southwest Soil um, group, have you had any discussions about hemp? Is there any kind of interest from people in that group. I mean, I know there's a fair, fair few farmers down in the southwest. I don't know if any of them are here, but there's a few license holders. We definitely have a few farmers. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, interestingly, I've not had much uh, discussion, uh, apart from the one farmer we've spoken to, to hopefully will be join, joining the group, uh, yes. who, who happens to be an organic farmer as well. It's an interesting crop, isn't it? Because it can be both grown organically, which has its advantages, but it can also fit into other systems. And I, th I think because of that, it's an interesting crop for anybody in farming who's looking for a great crop as such. And, and as Lydia sort of pointed out, oil sea rape, that used to be our, our mainstead to go to, perhaps, as a, do I say, a break crop in other cereals and things. Um, but we know we have some issues. <laughs> We're not going in there. Um, with that crop, so perhaps hemp offers an opportunity, as a, particularly as a crop. It's mm. it's interesting because it, it can go into quite poor quality soils and do benefit as well. So yeah, there's a lot to be be interested in. I think in this crop as a farmer, definitely. Uh, and there's as we mentioned, all the different opportunities. Oilseed rape is a high oil mm. <laughs> yielding crop, um, but hemp's thirty percent. Oil in the seed, uh, it's delicious, uh, very, very high in nutrition. Yeah, it's an ultimate superfood. So you've got a real broad spectrum of, of what uh, could be done. Um, Camilla, in, in terms of your scholarship, I know there was a big pandemic in between, uh, which kind of put scuppered uh, some of the plans. Um, but having been to America, how have you got any learnings from what they're doing in the States at the moment? Is there kind of, yeah, what have you Yeah, kind of yeah, there's a few, there's a few takeaways. Um, particularly from traveling to the States. I've also uh, spent the time where I couldn't travel doing a lot of desk research and reading a lot of papers. Uh, I also ended up doing a plant breeding course because I was finding that there was so much need for improvement in varieties and questions that were coming up about how do you improve varieties that I thought I need to understand a bit more about plant breeding, but that's to one side. So in terms of things that I found uh, in the USA, so... I visited Colorado, which is the home of cannabis of all THC strengths and went to a big uh, hemp conference that they have there called NOCO. Uh, and I think that's one of the first learnings that I had from the United States was how much drive and energy and collaboration there is within the hemp industry. So you've got things like major conferences for hemp, obviously getting opportunities like this where 
we're at a fantastic conference like Groundswell, which for me, I've been coming since 2016, so sitting here on stage is kind of a pinch me moment. Um, that's really fantastic, but we need more of it and we need more collaboration with academia to answer the questions that as growers we're having with how do we get the most out of this crop. So uh, in the United States, you've got lots of universities, such as top universities like Cornell, that have specific hemp programs and hemp breeding programs. So that's a way where they're really focusing on research, funding research, and getting the word out to the next generation of growers and people who want to build businesses. Um, in terms of processing, it's very, it was very interesting to see that the focus there has been on private business funding, setting up processing facilities, and this applies across both seed and fiber and generally working in a model where they take on the cost of establishing a processing facility and they have farmers growing under contract for them versus the model that Nathaniel, you mentioned, which I have also thought sounds really brilliant of working in a co-op and having more of a shared responsibility of running that processing facility between farmers. But the question is always like, well, well, you know, that's all well and good for the French, but people in England don't, or the United Kingdom, don't like to work together. Farmers are very awkward. So maybe that route might apply to us better. Um, and the third one is, and then I'll stop, is around um, the CBD side of things. So one of the issues within, uh, or issues that comes up around licensing in the UK is the fact that we can't do anything with the flower, it's got to be destroyed and we can only use the stem and seed. Uh, whereas in the United States, you can process the flower. And actually, the big focus for the growth of hemp initially in the big hemp boom in the United States was the interest in CBD. It's also one of the reasons why I started looking at hemp. And what they've experienced is loads and loads of interest in CBD loads of people going into growing hemp with this idea that they're going to have $10,000 margin per acre, investing in loads of really, really expensive kit, and then the market got flooded, bottom fell out of the market, and there's been a lot of people really disappointed. And you know, the, there's really sad stories that you hear about people who have really lost everything. I, I visited a uh, cattle grazer uh, in southern Colorado and um, he'd just installed a new meat fridge and he said oh yeah by the way this meat fridge I got from a local farmer who'd gone into growing hemp and they spent all their money on loads of kit they lost all of their money and they went bust and so they were selling off loads of stuff from the farm sorry to be gloomy but I think it's important to you know, talk about these things and talk about the downsides of hemp and the areas where it's not perfect and as you're saying it is very easy to say oh hemp's a perfect crop and hemp needs no inputs and hemp needs no nitrogen uh, actually we need to be thinking about how can this work and what is the system that's going to make it work and how do you grow it efficiently and profitably definitely that's um that's a great great point made i think we've got a lot to learn from the mistakes of the world <laughs> um, in general. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the one kind of shining glory is the kind of of the slow progression of, of hemp in the UK in some respects would be that um, that we can take learnings from Canada, America. No one's done it properly. No one's done it like uh, without fault, um, even within cooperatives and things like that. So I think it's, yeah, it's, it's really important to kind of bear that in mind um, when when we're kind of trying to shape an industry and, and something that's equitable for everyone um, and that's profitable, obviously. Um, but on that on that point, um, a quick uh, quick question for everyone in terms of hemp as a crop. Um, how best do you think hemp can impact or um, affect um, change and uh, contribute to a net zero society and economy? Uh, anyone? To start. Shall I, shall I start? Um, 
really good points, Camilla. And I, th and I think uh, I watched the, um, perhaps it's a little bit sad to admit this now, I watch the hemp futures uh, prices every, uh, every week. And um, I noticed the, the price crashing in America. And I think um, at the moment, uh, the licensing being as it is, you, you, you um, grow and supply products under an industrial license, which, as you rightly say, prohibits the use of both the flowers and the leaves. And I, and I think there is potential in the future for many non-cannabinoid products coming out of the flowers and leaves. So I think it, it would be good to try and, you know, put that whole mad idea about getting thousands of pounds from CBD production out and concentrate on the brilliance of the industrial market. You know, and I think there is potential to collect CBD for whatever uh, in a small way, but it would, I think that the way to produce um, high quality pseudo or actual pharmaceuticals is uh, in the way that they are produced now that you deliberately set out to do that. It's being done in terms of CBD uh, production at the Whissington plant. Um, I'm sure this is totally common knowledge at uh, um, just north of Cambridge. Um, by a pharmaceutical company, so they grow up specifically for CBD under a pharmaceutical license, and you know there comes a point when that's enough for the market. So uh, I think it's good to concentrate on all the other components of the crop. Um, you know there is a potential for the for the fibre and the shiv and potentially the oil. Uh, there's processing requirements to get them separated, but the other thing is as both Kamala and uh, Lynn has, has talked about is the the carbon sequestration. And the potential um, benefit that that will bring, you know, to UK citizens sounds a little grand, doesn't it? But carbon sequestration, there's no, no doubt about it. It's got a deep, complex, uh, long-lasting um, root system, which uh, will probably degrade at a much slower rate than a lot of other species, which have got a very fine, less deep root system. We don't really know yet how much. And uh, again, when I've talked to, to government about this, they say, how much? And uh, you go through all the, all the literature, and really, there is not the data out there. And so at the top of my list, literally, is um, I need data, and I bet Linda thinks the same. What is happening in a UK soil under UK conditions um, and uh, under different seasons and different weather conditions? And if we can get hold of that data, and then we can we can talk sensibly to to government about okay, so if we really are able to sequester that much, we're able to capture that much carbon, whether we sequester it long term or short term, and then how much will that contribute to potential future elm payments? You know, the environmental land management payments that uh, that are sort of um, on the way. Um, then we have a sen we have a sensible uh, dialogue, and we have. We do have, in my opinion, a sensible crop that can deliver that. Um, and as you say, three months is exciting, uh, perhaps more exciting in some ways than, than some of the perennial crops. What do you think, Lynn? Uh, yeah, um, three months to grow. Yeah, you, you say three months to grow. If, if we're growing for fibre, then um, it needs a month on the floor afterwards. So it's four months to grow. And if we're growing for seed, then we're not quite often harvesting until... Um, end of September, so it's four months, three months growing, but the harvest period is quite a lot longer. Um, the, the great potential that we're going to have from hemp is it's a, it's a crop that is going to be in demand. Um, there's, there's any amount of um, breeding development work that is going to need to be done. Once we've got the right varieties, there's a breeding program going on at Aberystwyth University, and Elsoms are involved in breeding programs. And it's once we get the right varieties that, that produce a fibre that is um, easier to deal with and is probably a little bit finer than what we've got at the moment for going into clothing products, then the demand for UK fibre for all sorts of things is, is, is virtually limitless as far as I can see. And, but then we've got... Then there is other, the, the other side of it as well, from a, from a seed crop, we can use the fibre to make really high quality paper. So it's, I'm back on products again, but it's, there is so many different markets that can be fulfilled by the crop. It's, uh, yeah, highly exciting. 
I'm going to come in on this one. Sorry, can't hear me. Um, we've just had a really interesting um, opportunity. Um, we had an American company that came to us to try and hopefully answer some of these questions um, as part of the Elon Musk X Prize for us to work out how much can how much can UK soil carbon uh, how much carbon can the UK soils hold um, with hemp. Now, unfortunately, the period that they gave us to work that out wasn't enough. But the beautiful thing about working with the X Prize is they put all our stats through their calculator, and it came out at 10 tons per hectare <coughs> per year, and we maxed that out in the three-month period. We don't know what the potential is. But even if we work it on 10 tons per hectare per year, as long as the farmer is actually farming it regeneratively and not blowing that carbon out by deep plowing and all the rest of it, then I'm, we're, we're looking at 30 tons at least. So we've seen figures going around, but if you just work out the fact that there's 30 tons per hectare, how many hectares are in hemp, now you're looking at a significant number of, um, of you know, carbon sequestering opportunities around the UK. And this is why corporates are now getting very interested in the potential that hemp has to, to offset carbon. And they're coming to us now. Um, you know, they're coming to us and saying, okay, we're reduced, we've re um, avoided our emissions, now we need to remove. And we understand one of the cheapest ways to do that is actually for hemp growers to start, um, you know, pulling that, that carbon out because it is pulling out at 10 tons. We know that's the baseline and there could be more. So the opportunities are there. We're looking at the data very, very carefully, but we know what the baseline um, uh, sequestration potential is, and I know we can do a lot better, I'm convinced of it, because this was very early successional soils. I would say that um, you might be asking, what, why can't we just measure it? Well, farmers, you have your <coughs> challenges with legislation, and, and as scientists, I believe we do too, because um, it's good to have Glenn on board, because like you say, the Channel Islands, you, you're slightly um, more open <coughs> to taking soils and analysing them a bit more widely. We, we meet challenges. We can take the soil and get it analysed, but we can't take any of the roots without having a licence. Uh, and if we're going to look at carbon properly, as, as Glyn will, will back me up, we need to look both in the mineral soil component, we need to look in the roots, and we need to look into the biology of, of, of that soil as well. So the challenge is there for the UK is partly driven <coughs> by, by UK legislation preventing wider scientific investigation. Um, we do our best in innovative farming. We've come up with um, alternative methods to begin that journey, and thankfully with the combination with what Glyn is also being able to, to do, um, I think it's helping us build that evidence that we need to make the bigger push to, to make it a, an easier job to do. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously, yeah, e echoing the, the fact that there is these barriers uh, that unfortunately face us. Um, but we've got to start somewhere. And I think there, there certainly feels this year that there's a more accepting ear, um, potentially, from different departments and things like that um, within government. Um, we've definitely had some good conversations over the, the last couple of days, um, which is all promising. Um, but I mean, until it comes tangible and actual, um, then I think we, yeah, we still have to keep battling. Um, <coughs> sorry, yeah, it's all right. Are you, are you okay, Camilla? Do you want to top in? Hi, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's having a small Theresa May moment. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to each of you, can you give an example of? Uh, a recent hemp innovation or um, new development that kind of excites you or uh, you think might kind of take off or strike the right tone? <coughs> Anybody? <laughs> a really good one, that one. Without giving too much IP a away. Too much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the opportunity here is for um, farmers to rotate hemp into their, um, you know, their cash crops and then max out on the carbon. Um, so look at, look, out, look at hemp as really being, uh, well, there's two areas. There's the, the, if you've got poor soils, contaminated soils, there's a project that we're working on in Cumbria where the farmer, um, unfortunately, the wrong sort of, well, <laughs> uh, nitrogen fertilizer was put on. Um, 
you know, uh, someone came in and spread it and basically killed his soils. Um, and he's taken his, he's had to take his, A, the cattle all passed or died or he had to kill them. Um, and he's taken the whole of his farm out of production um, for two years just to be able to regenerate it because he took on the wrong um, MPK fertilizer. So that gave him a problem, but it's also given us an opportunity. So we're now looking at growing hemp on that land because um, hemp is a really good bioremediating crop to bring that land back in again. And the farmer is going to get paid for that hemp because what we're going to do is buy that hemp off, it, off him and biochar it. Um, and then that biochar is actually being supped up by, I won't give you the names, but let's call it a tarmacking company. Um, because they're going to incorporate that biochar into the asphalt. So he's out of, out of a real disaster, he's got something. And that all came through the fact that hemp is such a fantastic bioremediating crop. So if you're trying to decontaminate soils for whatever reason, consider hemp. It's really good. It does work and it does the job well. But just be careful on what you do with that hemp afterwards. So put it away into um, building materials or... You know, um, I know the cement industry is getting very interested in biocharred hemp, um, you know, because it can lock away, lock away the, com the carbon, which they've got an issue with. The Ashfeld companies are getting very interested. We don't know. You know, we don't know what the, the, the potential is out there. But all I'm saying is please just consider putting it into your rotation because um, it does build soil health really well. Be careful on how you do farm it. Reach out to Nathaniel um, and the co-op because they're very good at pointing you in the right direction and, and most importantly, getting you around the regulations. I think the other um, potential of hemp, um, one of the sort of growing issues we have is, is this need for, for industry to offset by carbon credits that seems to be having an adverse effect on farm prices. And farms are being brought up to simply plant trees, uh, which is perhaps taking some of that land out of food production. Um, and perhaps hemp is one of those crops. There are, there are others out there as well, perhaps miscanthus as well. But we're looking for alternatives that will allow us to <laughs> utilize land, farmland, still for food or fiber production. And, and still have that carbon offsetting uh, potential that companies can buy credit from as well. So I think uh, it's an interesting crop um, for that for the future. Absolutely. That's a really great point. Um, three, um, three, just to show scope as much of anything, things that pop into my mind in terms of innovative hemp projects that I've seen recently. Uh, the first is a project in Morocco, which is encouraging people who are growing cannabis illegally to grow hemp instead, and then using that hemp to build housing in that area. Uh, the second was a talk that I went to um, at NOCO, about, which was about extracting uh, xylitol, which is used as a sweetener in chewing gum from hemp Shiv, and the third one is a artist who makes amazing hempcrete sculptures, which are really beautiful, almost Henry Moore esque abstract representations of the female form, which just shows the scope of the ways that it's being used. Um, and the other thing, uh, which a lot of people have asked me about in the last few days, and I'm not sure about it, so it'd be really interesting to see if anyone on the panel has some ideas is about hemp and intercropping and if there's any potential there because obviously intercropping and diversity in crops is something that a lot of us here are very excited about. Can I pick up on that? Yeah, yeah so uh, hemp, there's some evidence to suggest it has additional properties, um, be it an amaticide properties, so potentially um, it has benefit of growing it with co-crops to um, prevent um, root um, not... Um, issues coming into the crops um, have to be a little bit careful with that the, the evidence mainly coming out of the United States so nothing wrong with the science but it's limited to their soils so again an area that we need to investigate a little bit more but we mustn't forget there's also evidence coming out of Europe as well so their soil types and climate are, are more compatible perhaps with us 
But yeah, it certainly offers these opportunities to protect the soil, as others have pointed out here today, um, to offer coverage to prevent erosion, but also to to combine. What we don't know, and, and is part of this innovative farming, is how it interacts with the above ground biodiversity as well as the below ground biodiversity. So perhaps from an intercropping, we don't quite know how it's going to affect the, the pollinators. So that perhaps is some, somewhere we need to investigate further. Um, yeah, intercropping, that's an interesting thing. Uh, we're looking for a, a standard hemp that is hemp and only hemp because when we harvest the stalk, we don't want any other contaminations in it. If we're adding um, another crop into it, 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 it may not be impossible to separate, but it's going to increase the, uh, the issues we have in processing. I, I understand all the, the benefits, but I practically I'm unsure as <laughs> how it's going to work. Um, and you asked, Nathaniel asked uh, about an interesting hemp development. There is companies who are trying to develop hemp batteries that are actually charge quicker, hold more power, and discharge more fully than any of, the, um, any of the batteries that are there at the moment, any of the best ones that are there. So that's, that's the, the Cambridge University working on it, and then there's other private people working on it as well. So that's potentially really interesting. At a fraction of a cost of graphene, isn't it, as, as yeah. well? It's a thousandth yeah. of the cost. It's yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to add um, some other... It's almost like it feels like dribs and drabs, but I think uh, once we get a little bit of science behind it to see just how good it is. So there's been quite a bit of work, not in the UK, on um, not just soil improvement, and I think there's huge potential for that, and I think there's a huge need for getting the uh, literally just the organic carbon back up to a point where our soils are more resilient. The other side of it is if soils have become contaminated in some way, and... Um, the brilliant thing about hemp is that because it can go to a food market in the form of oil or it can go to a totally industrial, non-consumed market, an industrial market, so the potential for bioremediation of contaminated uh, land is, is quite high. Um, and then that material can be used for something that is perfectly safe. You know, there's not vast quantities of, of UK land that is contaminated, but there is, you know, there are sizable chunks and um, it's... Uh, it's a cost-effective and gentle way of doing it without then issues with what you do with the material afterwards. So I think that would be an interesting and exciting one, and it certainly has been tried in other parts of the world. 100%, and it was actually a, a study that came out last year or beginning of this year from Italy. Um, the Italians have used hemp and phytoremediation for numerous different projects, but this one actually tested... Um, the amount of contaminants in the biomass, the above-ground biomass, and they found that most of it was in the leaves. Uh, the, the stem was relatively l low on that, uh, which opens up opportunities market-wise as well. So, yeah, you're right, there's been zero research in the UK. And again, back to the legislation, uh, licenses are an exemption from the Misuse of Drugs Act. It is a scheduled narcotic still um, for agricultural land only. So that closes a lot of, I mean footpaths I mean yeah we're not going to get into that um so <laughs> thank you everyone uh, but I'm going to pass it over to the floor now um I think we've got one question uh from this chap in the hat on the third row yes thank you all I think we've got about 10 minutes left yeah. <laughs> um thanks um it's magic hemp as far as I can work out and just hearing all of your stories just confirms it even more. And um, the reason why I wanted to ask a question is because I'm a farmer. We've been growing hemp um, over a number of years. I think we've grown it eight years. We grew it from about 1998 to 2006, and then we grew it again in 2018, 19. And um, I don't really remember so well the process in the first instance, but the second, in second instance, we grew for fibre and got a licence to grow for fibre. Quite a rigorous process. Um, and, and then we did that for two years. Second crop was a bit of a disaster. And so we looked to grow uh, for seed. And so we then applied for seed. And um, with 
uh, with, do, you, do you know hempen? Where of hempen? Yep. yep. Some of the hempen here. Some of them oh, fantastic. Yeah. Hi. Um, and so we kind of did a sort of joint venture, and uh, we were looking at growing for fiber and, and having some straw bales and, or hemp bales rather, um, which were going to be used as maybe part of a building project. Um, it didn't end up working out like that, but we had this amazing resource of, of hemp. Uh, and there were various things we started thinking about, you know, what we could use it for. And then we thought, well, let's try and get, get a license for seed. And so we went to the Home Office for the license and uh, we had a change of personnel or something. And we asked, we asked if we could get it. And, and, and they looked at us, they did a desktop analysis and they saw that we were 350 metres from a footpath. And they said, no, I'm afraid you can't grow hemp. And we were like, what? This is ridiculous. I walk into a supermarket and I can see that there's this amazing nutritious seed, which is the best supplier of omega-3 outside fish oil. And you're telling me that, you know, we can't grow that. It's ridiculous. Um, and then they said, you're quite close to the atomic weapons establishment. And I was like, ah. It's like, what on earth has that got to do with growing hemp? And so there are these sort of very strange kind of rules as to kind of, you know, how... And, and or why we couldn't we we couldn't grow hemp, and then a really good friend of mine started looking into the potential of hemp, and suddenly realised that actually there's all these amazing things that you can do with it. And I was like, my God, this is incredible! This crop, it's just you know, it's, we need to you know investigate this more. And um, so I've been talking to um, um, various people at Hemp, including Patrick, and um, Patrick suggested doing a, a, a bit of a round table with farmers to talk about, uh, well, planting more hemp. And, uh, and I don't know, it's a bit of a, it's a sort of question, it's a bit of a rambling kind of anecdote, this, really. But uh, the question is, uh, is there a, like an existing network of connections between people who are involved with growing hemp? Uh, are, are people talking to each other? And, uh, and obviously, there's just so many different elements to the hemp industries. Uh, is there an argument for bringing more people into that conversation, and um, and I'm being slightly lazy here because it would avoid me doing loads of work and sending out emails and stuff. But we are planning on doing a, a small sort of conference at the end of October, beginning of November. We haven't quite fixed on the date yet, but round about then, to talk about this with farmers. And uh, we're just outside Reading, in between Reading and Newbury. Um, and I, I'd love to invite anybody who's interested to this event, of which we haven't quite worked out what the date is, but if anybody is interested, then please come and give me their details. Um, and I very much welcome the prospect of being able to have a conversation, a further conversation about this, if it's of interest. So uh, it's not really a question, it sort of is a question, but it's a <laughs> bit of extra background. Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, I'll, I'll just touch on it briefly. Um, I think, yes, yeah, it's, it's a great point. British Hemp Alliance is, is set up uh, largely for that reason to, to network and bring people together. Um, we've collaborated and, and been a part of the Hemp 30 project, um, which was a, a fantastic project, which was funded by Bayes. Um, it brought a lot of different stakeholders together, the scientific community, um, yeah, who've got a lot of experience, a lot of farmers. Um, and they, they, they went in quite deep and they've, they've mapped out a 10-year plan. Um, unfortunately, that uh, report uh, is still yet to be published, but it will be shared as soon as possible. Um, and they, they missed out on the second round of funding. But it's, uh, it's, it's exciting because it did bring together a lot of different stakeholders. Um, and I think there have been roundtables, um, but certainly need more discussion um, because I think, yeah, we've all touched on the, the opportunities and how can we, uh, yeah, how can we work on those together and find our own niche? Um, I think it's really important. So, I don't know if anyone else has any comments on that question. Um, I, I think it's great. The more, well, just look who's on the stage. Um, the variety that's on the stage, you know, we've got top scientists, um, Nayab and Cranfield, um, and, and, and they're excited about this crop. And, you know, <laughs> that, that to me is really, really something. Um, I'm excited because I have seen it. I've seen the differences it makes to the follow-on crops, the cash crops. Um, and it is an amazing cash crop in its own right. So, you know, I just, I can't get over why there is so much resistance. Well, actually, I know why there is, but, you know, it's it just, we've just got to do it somehow. We've just got to go on it. And, and again, let's work together. Um, we will find a way. I mean, it, it seems really interesting how the government approaches it. And I, I heard an anecdote of 
Crispin Blunt being approached by a quite a well-known sort of moderate pro-European uh, Tory MP. And, and, and she said, she came up to Crispin, and she said, the problem with you, Crispin, is you're soft on drugs. And it's a big, it's a big issue, that. And I guess the question is how to tackle the Home Office, really, and how we, we could approach that as a, as a wider group. Excellent point. I think we've got a, another question for the audience. Thank you very much. Rachel Jeffries, I'm a farmer. Um, we farm a thousand acres. Um, I looked at hemp ten years ago, probably after seeing some somewhere, um, and dismissed it as a niche thing. Um, obviously, I'm back here again listening to you, so obviously it's not as niche as um, I felt it was ten years ago. Um, thank you for your presentation. Really enjoyed it. For me, as a you know currently a conventional farmer, I'm really interested in the idea of um, drilling through my very, very heavy clay with these amazing tap roots. Um, what I want to know is, can I use it with my um, combined harvester? Can I chop it up into little pieces and put it back into the soil? So not even bother um, actually harvesting and making a fibre out of it. You know, can I chop it with my combine and um, use it as a mulch? No. No, I mean, I literally know nothing about um, hemp, and I was hoping to learn a bit more about actual hemp growing as opposed to perhaps the politics um, of it. I mean, right. the innovation That'd side sounds amazing. That would be a whole other day, I think, or week, to be yeah. fair, or 20 um, years. I mean, the politics sounds incredible. <laughs> very quick, um, very quick um, uh, season for growing hemp. Uh, Sun in May gets to full height and starts to flower by the beginning of August and harvest and finished with within the, the, either six weeks or possibly eight weeks later. The, if you were to um, want to mulch it, you would probably have to use a forage harvester to chop it. You wouldn't chop it with your combine chopper. Um, you could, I suppose, roll it and just drill straight through it and leave it as it is, like some of these drills we can potentially do that we've seen out here past couple of days but it is it's extremely difficult to chop up it needs chopping when it's green as it just fluffs up and turns to a fiber and wraps around everything and I, I think to add to that what would worry me a little bit uh of integrating it straight into the soil is that you get nutrient lockup. um so i would um i would worry a little bit uh i think Yes, I think the I think the roots the roots there's no doubt about that that they're very robust. Uh, so as I said before, the literature is quite contradictory. The, it ranges from the roots will penetrate two meters, which I very much doubt will actually happen in the UK. To uh, an Italian study looked at um, definitely two hundred uh, centimeters was a bit more normal. And if you had a soil like this, I, I doubt it would go. Even that deep, but I think that's that's the big question, isn't it? How deep? But but certainly you will get penetration. Sorry, yes, I've got my notes in the wrong place. Quite right, um, but I think uh, you will get you will get a long-lasting root system. Uh, it's 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 tougher and uh, and sl slower to break down than a lot of roots, and so I think using a bit of mulch and then leaving the the, the roots to um, to open up the soil is probably a better method than actually trying to put it into the soil. So I'll come in and tell you how we did it in Jersey. We just did exactly that. We composted it. So we grew it, um, we cut it, and we composted it, and then we put that back in the soil. The fungi released to the clay platelets, and we could grow deeper the next year, and that brought on a better crop. Compost it. If, if you wanted to combine it, uh, grow for seed... That's what we did, and we went through it with our class combine that we use on all our other cereals. Um, I'm probably going to jinx myself now, and our combine will catch fire. But everyone said it's going to be awful. Definitely not with a rotary combine, and it, and it won't work. And um, if you have everything open, it, it went through OK. Um, <clears throat> we, had, we then had about that much straw left, which isn't that much more and sort of clumps of where it had been spat out the back of the combine which isn't that much more than you'd have from a straw residue um, so 
I don't see any reason why you couldn't chop that and leave it on the straw surface. On the soil, we actually cut it and baled it, but I think you could probably do that. The, the worry would be for drilling into it, as Nick said, knowing how many problems you can have drilling into just straw re residue on the surface. Hemp straw residue could, could yeah, could really get wrapped around things. Uh, I I would say stick with the bioengineering of your roots because you might as well get a value from the crop that you're growing. The leaves, I believe, I'm correct, have to stay in the field anyhow. That's going to return organics and, and nutrients back to the soil. And ho however deep those roots go, it's going to be helping the structure of that soil. We've talked about soil health, but we focused on organic matter. I'd like to do a shout out for the fact that soil health, I'm not getting into the debate of what we mean by soil health, but soil health is much wider than just organic matter. It links to all functions, so structure is an important part of soil health. Yes, yeah, so live roots, great. I think, yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Another, another option would be to overwinter. Uh, leave it in the in the field. Uh, the fiber then disintegrates, um, and then you can. It's quite brittle. Um, yeah, you, you, yeah, you exactly. It's, it's, a, it's a play off. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think yeah, we've got one yeah. more question. Hi. I just wondered if anyone has any experience of intercropping hemp with other things. Um, be interesting to know what ibers can come up with in terms of their breeding program, and whether it, it's always occurred to me that some of the leggier varieties of hemp. You know, if, if they were bred to contain a lower lower THC and CBD and therefore be legal to, to grow under license, some of the leggier, taller varieties would be ideal um, intercropping partners for, say, runner beans, which otherwise are quite difficult to grow on a field scale. Um, and I just wondered whether sort of there would be a way in the retting process to recover the fiber and rot out the, the runner bean stalks whether that sounds like a crazy idea just to put it out there. And therefore to harvest the hemp seed, the runner beans, and the fiber. It's just, if you mind, um, very quickly, try it. We don't know. Um, but this is the three sisters idea, and I'm sure it works. It works with maize. It should work with hemp. Give it a go. Um, the the license is a the fee of five hundred and forty pound. Is it the first year, or for the first three years? So that's that's a basic basically a consideration is, um, and you need to grow enough to put fill a truck up. And the the, the seed when you're buying small amounts is very expensive. I know. I, I <laughs> you wouldn't know about that. I, I buy a lot of seed for a lot of people, that's so true, it, yeah, yeah. I can get seed yeah, yeah. at a better price. Would, would be a potential. <laughs> Well, it would, but then you've got to work out... If you're growing for fibre, you're going to have to work out how you're going to cut it. And in the field, it's cut. We built a cutter, and it cuts it at 1.8 metres, cuts it in half, cuts it at the bottom. So that's... You need to sort out the harvesting technique before you actually think about sowing a crop. There's a little bit more to it than just chopping it off at the ground. But, but a great question, I'd say. Yeah, get, get involved with the BHA, and there's plenty of kind of uh, yeah discussion to, to be had. So yeah, thank you very much uh, to all the panel. I think I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. Thank you for your time. <laughs>